I'm Norman Green. I'm chairing the Committee on Capital Punishment, the Association. As some of you know, this is our second program within a week, so we're all kind of tired, but uh, we're going to make a go of it. This is a lot different than the other one. The previous program was with Governor Ryan. Today's program is a book on, I guess, death penalty as it used to be in New York. This is a program inspired by one of our speakers, Scott Christensen, and his book, which is in the back table, available for purchase on the Sing Sing Death House. It's a program about the days when the Sing Sing electric chair was in full swing. Now, as you may know, the death penalty is in its infancy in New York. <coughs> no execution for over 35 years. And unfortunately, there's no one really involved in executing, uh, in administering executions today who was really active in state government. But once New York had a mature death penalty, and when I reviewed Scott's book for the New York Law Journal, I remember many aspects of those days and learned a lot by reading it. For example, um, there was, instead of long stays on death rows, there were one or two year delays between sentence and execution. There were the last meals, which are shown in Scott's book, which he well describes. And there were the last walks along what now is almost becoming a term of art, the Green Mile in New York with minimal recorded resistance from the inmates who essentially just went to the chair as they were told. There were claims of innocence that were ignored. There was bad representation of the condemned from their counsel, inexperienced counsel representing those people. There were failed cases of clemency, and they're all the, almost all of the people were poor, and most of them, many of them were minority. Same problems as we have today, in fact. And of course, we had the oddity of an anti-death penalty warden in New York <clears throat> doing his job and killing hundreds of people while speaking out against the death penalty. <laughs> the same Lewis Laws, which is named, that's who it was, who wrote of his work that the hand of the law drops a living man or woman into the death house hopper where the chair and the surgeon's knives and saws converted into the finished product, a grisly corpse. There was always in New York a post-execution autopsy I guess it wasn't to figure out the cause of death, they knew that. Speak up, please. Speak I'm up. Sorry. Uh, are we having microphone problems? Yeah. 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 Are we really? This is not good. Okay. All right. But most of all, if, as we read uh, through Scott's book, we see the pictures, the pictures of the now dead people um, dressed in their suits as they came from court um, before they were executed. Now, Scott's book helps us break through the use of euphemism that surrounds capital punishment. You know what the euphemisms are. Just following the law, justice is being done, I'm doing my duty. And like all good capital punishment literature, Scott's book analyzes what was really going on. This is especially important since as citizens, prosecutors, judges, and governors, or governor's counsel, as you'll find out tonight, we're divorced from the actual execution machinery and do not see what is being done in our name. An earlier example of Scott's approach appears in a work by Leo Tolstoy, which I came across recently, called I Cannot Be Silent, which he wrote in 1908, where he says the scene of a hanging in Tsarist Russia. And he reminds us that it's not only the executioners who are responsible for hanging, but it's we ourselves. Th thus he writes that the hangmen soak the nooses so they may tighten better. They seize the shackled men, put shrouds on them, lead them to a scaffold, place the well-soaked nooses around their necks. The condemned are then pushed off benches where their own weight suddenly tightens the nooses around their necks and they are painfully strangled. Men alive and men before become corpses dangling from a rope, at first swinging slowly and then resting motionless. And all this is carefully arranged by enlightened men of the upper class. And then he talks about all the authorities who are involved in the execution process, saying as follows. Before being hangmen, generals, public prosecutors, judges, premiers, or czar, are you not men? Today allowed a peep into God's world, tomorrow ceasing to be. Is it possible that in your lucid moments you do not see that your vocation in life cannot be to torture and kill men, yourselves trembling with fear of being killed, lying to yourselves, to others, and to God, assuring yourself and others that by participating in these things you are doing an important and grand work for the welfare of millions? Yet consider it, all you accomplices in murder, from the highest to the lowest, consider who you are and cease to do what you are doing. Cease for your soul's sake and for the God who lives within you. 
And with these comments from Leo Tolstoy, we'll proceed to uh, introduce the panel. Um, first of all, I guess, is Barbara Jaffe, who was the principal court attorney for Justice Marcy Kahn in the New York State Supreme Court. Barbara will be our moderator tonight. She is also a member of the Unified Court Systems Capital Cases Judicial Resource Committee, assisting in the development and presentation of educational and training programs for the New York State judges presiding capital cases. Next will be Judge John Keenan, who was a judge for the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York and has been so since 1983. It really seems like the time has gone by really quickly. But he's not there tonight because he's a judge. He's here because he was a homicide prosecutor and handler of death cases among his caseload uh, during the era of Frank Hogan. Also from that era is Jack Hoffinger over here, who is a partner in the firm of Hoffinger, Friedland, Dobrisch, and Stern, specializing in criminal litigation. He was assistant district attorney in New York County around the time of uh, John Keenan, Judge Keenan, and he was um, a defense counsel in a couple of capital cases. Norman Redlick, former dean of New York University Law School. Uh, he joined the NYU Law Faculty in 1958 and served as dean from 75 to 88. And he is presently counsel to the law firm of Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz, where he specializes in legal ethics and litigation. Now, he's not here because of that, but because as a young lawyer, he served as counsel to the New York Committee to Abolish Capital Punishment, which at the time was the only group in New York State dedicated to the abolition of capital punishment. I guess uh, Norman is in the late 50s, right? right? Although the committee was disbanded after the abolition of the death penalty, he, he organized and served as president of Justice PAC, a committee whose purpose was to raise funds to support the candidacy of death penalty opponents, with emphasis on securing the votes to sustain Governor Cuomo's veto of death penalty legislation. For those of you who don't know, this is something that Governor Cuomo is well known for, vetoing um, death penalty legislation. Okay. Um, in addition to his career in academia and private practice, uh, Norman Redlick has been corporation counsel for the city of New York during the days of John Lindsay and worked on the Warren Commission. Bob McCrake. Uh, senior counsel to Sullivan and Cromwell, currently. Uh, former president of the American Bar Association, the State Bar Association, and why he's here tonight. He was counsel to the governor, Rockefeller, from 1959 to 1962. Saul Corbin. <coughs> I think your, your blur has, has left, so I will tell that you were counsel yourself to Governor Rockefeller, and you were the, <coughs> for, and during what years did that? 62 through 65, after succeeding Bob McCrae. Right, so after Bob McCrae, uh, Saul Corbin becomes Governor Rockefeller's counsel. Uh, during that time, you handled clemency cases, as did Bob McCrae, and you were the founder of the New York City law firm, Corbin, so, could you speak a little louder? San Severino. I think we're going to have to get this watched here. This <laughs> Lowered. Lowered. Yeah. Um, all right. Hopefully, the next speaker will be able to handle the mics better. And I will turn this over to Mark Jeff. How's that? Good. Here? Okay. Great. The title of this evening's program was derived not only from Scott Christensen's chilling book but also from United States Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman's 1994 dissent from a denial of cert in Callens v. Collins. There, Justice Blackman, following a pointed concurring opinion by Justice Scalia, famously declared that, quote, from this day forward, I no longer shall tinker with the machinery of death. Justice Blackman was primarily despairing of the futility of reconciling the principles of guided discretion and individualized sentencing, a conflict that did not arise in death penalty jurisprudence until the 1970s. Thus, while tonight's panelists did not tinker with the machinery of death in the same manner as Justice Blackman, they did struggle with issues that foreshadowed that conflict and with other issues with which we continue to struggle today. <coughs> 
Many of those issues were addressed by the Temporary Commission on Revision of the Penal Law and Criminal Code, or the Bartlett Commission, named for its chair, Richard Bartlett. We'll now hear about the Bartlett Commission, its 1965 recommendation that capital punishment, capital punishment be abolished in New York, and about the executive and legislative responses. Some of our panelists were closely associated with the Bartlett Commission and its members. Others were part of Governor Rockefeller's staff. Their views and recollections may vary, but we value them all. We'll also hear about what it was like to practice law in the shadow of death three decades ago in New York. And finally, we'll, we will hear about New York's death row at the infamous Sing Sing prison. As Norman Redlich observed in his 1990 remarks published in the Albany Law Review, quote, it is terribly important to go back to where we started. While the debate about the death penalty has its origins in antiquity, important inquiries concerning its efficacy and morality were made, and some believe answered, in 1965 and the years preceding the Bartlett Commission's report. I want to thank this evening's panelists very much for being so generous with their time in preparing this program. Special thanks to Norman Redlin, <coughs> who conceived of the program, and as always to Norman Green, and the program's co-sponsors, the Committee on Civil Rights, chaired by Rod Tabak, and the Books of the Bar Committee, chaired by Thomas McEnany. I also thank Robert McCrae for preparing the excellent handout, which contains a chronology of events in the exercise of executive clemency during the Rockefeller years that you have to decide there, the two relevant Bartlett Commission reports, and a law review note entitled, Reviving Mercy and the Structure of Capital Punishment. The order of the program follows the order of a, cap of a capital prosecution. Judge Keenan, former prosecutor, will thus be our first speaker. Jack Hoffinger, former defense counsel, will be second. Norman Redlick, who presented clemency petitions for consideration by Governor Rockefeller, will be next. And Robert McCrane and Saul Corbin, former counsels to Governor Rockefeller, will then make their presentations. Finally, author Scott Christensen will discuss his book, Condemned, Inside the Sing Sing Death House. We've allotted 10 minutes to each speaker. We'll then have cross-questioning by the panelists, and then questions from the audience. As for the topic of mercy, I want to close my remarks with what the Greek philosopher Seneca said about his own dispensation of mercy, and I quote, One man's youth sways me, another's age. One man I have reprieved for his evidence, another for his insignificance. And when I found no other ground for pity, I have shown charity to myself. Judge Keenan? My thanks to the Association of the Bar for having included me as a member of this panel concerning this important subject. I am here not to advocate or argue for or against a particular position, but rather to attempt to describe and explain the law as it existed in the 1950s and the 1960s relating to capital punishment in New York State. Also, I have been asked to relate the facts of certain capital cases of which I have personal knowledge, or which I actually tried as the prosecutor during the 1960s. Under the old penal law, which was in effect until 1962, first-degree murder prosecutions were conducted under Section 1044 of the New York Penal Law. Subdivision 1 of Section 1044 covered premeditated and deliberate common law murder. If there were a conviction under subdivision one, a death sentence automatically followed, and there would be a direct appeal to the New York Court of Appeals bypassing the appellate division. Under subdivision two of the first degree murder section, 1044, prosecutions took place for felony murder and for homicides where the killing evidenced a depraved indifference to human life. With respect to subdivision two, primarily felony murders, as part of its verdict, the jury was required to recommend either life imprisonment or the death penalty. If the jury disagreed as to which sentence should be imposed, the result was a hung jury. One famous case, the People versus Rosario, which resulted in the very well-known Rosario rule concerning prior statements of witnesses, this is the state equivalent 
Section 3500, is an example of the hung jury I speak of. In Rosario, an Orthodox Jew who was running a dairy restaurant on the Lower East Side was shot and killed in a holdup early one morning in the late 1950s. His name was Irving Schickler, and his assailants were Messrs. Rosario, Alicia, and Rios. The case in which Alexander Herman, <coughs> now deceased, then head of the Homicide Bureau in Frank Hogan's office, was the chief prosecutor, was presided over by the late Mitchell D. Schweitzer of the Court of General Sessions. The late Leonard Sandler of the Appellate Division First Department, the Honorable Edwin Torres, now a Justice of the Supreme Court of the State of New York, who sits in Manhattan, and I assisted in the prosecution. The jury convicted Mr. Rosario and recommended death. The jury convicted Mr. Rios and recommended life. However, the jury, <coughs> although all agreeing as to his guilt, hung as to Alicia, 10 for death and 2 for life. Governor Rockefeller commuted Rosario's death sentence, and Alicia ultimately pleaded guilty to second degree murder and received a sentence of 40 years to life. Hung juries where guilt beyond a reasonable doubt of some degree of homicide was established unanimously did not solely occur in felony murder cases. They also took place in common law murder prosecutions under Section 1044, Subdivision 1, the deliberate and premeditated form. One well-known common law murder case, which I investigated and helped to prosecute, the people against Charles Clinton, resulted in a disagreement the first time the case was tried, with 11 votes for guilty of murder in the first degree, and one vote for guilty of murder in the second degree. This was a case where the defendant had ensured the deceased's life and then thrown him out a window to his death from a hotel, which was up where Lincoln Center is now, a hotel called the Marie Antoinette, which was at the northwest corner of 66th Street and Broadway. After the 11-1 hung jury, the second trial convicted Mr. Glinton of first degree murder, common law, after approximately five hours of deliberations. There were numerous appeals, both to the state courts and ultimately to the federal courts with habeas corpus applications. The conviction was affirmed. Governor Rockefeller ultimately commuted Linton's death sentence to life in prison. Another interesting first degree common law murder indictment involved a killing where the victim was gone down by a young man who was a United States Marine. The defendant put the body in a crate and sought to send it to a distant state by railway express. The remains were delivered by the defendant himself to Penn Station for shipment to the faraway point. The body was discovered, the defendant was apprehended, and he stood trial. <coughs> the jury hung. Four for manslaughter in the first degree, four for murder in the second degree, and four for first degree murder. The defendant pleaded guilty before a second trial. In both of these cases, all jurors agreed as to guilt. The question was the degree thereof. In 1962, as you will learn uh, more fully, I'm sure, from Messrs. McGrady and Corbin, the law changed, and a second phase or penalty stage of the trial was introduced. At the first stage of the bifurcated trial, the jury would pass upon guilt or innocence without regard to the punishment. If there were a conviction of first degree murder, a second stage of the trial would then be conducted at which the prosecution was permitted to introduce evidence otherwise inadmissible at the guilt stage of the proceedings. And the, the evidence that was permissible was evidence of aggravating behavior by the defendant, which the prosecution would argue warranted the death penalty. And the defense would introduce mitigating evidence. Hearsay was admissible during this second stage of the proceedings. The prosecution was entitled to bring before the jury evidence relating to the defendant's prior convictions, including the conduct which led to the conviction. 37 years ago, in November and December of 1963, I prosecuted a man by the name of Charles Terry, <coughs> who had sexually assaulted and strangled to death a woman named Clegg in her hotel room some block and a half from where we are this evening. This was the second bifurcated prosecution conducted in New York State. At the second phase, <coughs> the punishment proceedings, 
I called witnesses from the state of Maine who introduced evidence of the defendant's previous forcible rape conviction there and of another conviction that he had for assault with intent to commit rape in Maine. There was also evidence concerning another felony conviction that he had received and also evidence of his dishonorable discharge from the Marine Corps. The jury voted death unanimously and after all appeals concluded uh, affirming the conviction, Governor Rockefeller in the 1965 uh, sequence where all death sentences were commuted, commuted the death sentence in the Terry case. In 1964, the law again changed and the death penalty could only be imposed if the victim was a peace officer or a correction official under certain very li limited circumstances. Two other death eligible cases which I personally prosecuted in the 1960s were the People versus Lloyd Mackey and the People versus Robert Bornholt and Albert Victory. Both of these were murders of on-duty New York City police officers. In the Mackey case, the officer who was assigned to, the officer who was assigned to moral enforcement was in the process of arresting a prostitute when Mackey, the prostitute's pimp, demanded that the officer let the woman go free. The officer refused, and Mackey stabbed him to death. Mackey had a prior conviction for attempted murder in Broward County, Florida. I prosecuted him for first degree murder. The jury convicted, and in the penalty stage, after evidence of the Florida conviction and other prior bad acts, they hung eight to four for death. It was office policy in the Manhattan DA's office then, although not the law, but it was policy, because Frank Hogan <coughs> was not a great fan of the death penalty, but he carried out the law. The rule was that we did not seek the death penalty a second time once the jury disagreed in the death phase. So, Mr. Mackey was sentenced to life. In the Bornholt victory case, Bornholt, at the urging of victory, shot and killed a uniformed police officer who was attempting to arrest victory. Both had serious prior records. But Bornholt, although legally responsible, had some psychiatric problems. And Victory, who had an extensive record of prior violence, was not the shooter. Victory had three prior felony convictions. The jury disagreed with a vote of nine to three for death against Victory and seven to five for death against Bornholt. They, as Mackey, were sentenced to life in prison. All right, now, Terry, the man who was commuted, who strangled a woman near here, who had the prior rape and assault with intent to commit rape, he died in prison on May 13th of 1981. Lloyd Mackey, <coughs> with his previous attempted at murder conviction and his life sentence, was paroled on February 28th, 1998. And according to the parole authority, he's apparently in Miami, Florida. Robert Bornholt is presently in Attica prison and has a parole hearing in February of 2001. Last year, between Christmas and New Year's, Albert Victory was released on parole. He was found in violation of parole last spring and has since been reincarcerated. One note about a case in the book, Condemned, the case is called Eddie Lee Mays. Mr. Mays is the last man to have been executed in New York State. I have been asked to comment about the Mays case. The case was tried by my immediate predecessor as head of the Homicide Bureau in the New York County District Attorney's Office, Vincent J. Dermody. And the investigation in preparation of that case was conducted by <coughs> former Assistant District Attorney Alan G. Schwartz, who later was Corporation Counsel, as was Mr. Redlick, and who is now a colleague of mine on the Southern District of New York for federal court that sits in Manhattan. I read with, Mr. with interest Mr. Christensen's book, Condemned, and on page four thereof, Mr. Christensen wrote as follows, quote, Sing Sing's final electrocution and the last legal execution carried out in New York State during the 20th century involved Eddie Lee Mays, a 34-year-old black man who was convicted of shooting to death a white woman on Fifth Avenue. My recollection of the case was a little different from Mr. Christensen's report. And last week, I inquired of Judge Schwartz about his recollection of the Eddie Lee Mays case. 
The victim was not, as Mr. Christensen suggests, a white woman, but rather was an innocent black patron in a bar in central Harlem, which Mr. Mays held up at gunpoint during daytime hours. And when Mr. Mays brandished his pistol, the other patrons in the bar continued talking, apparently unimpressed by Mr. Mays or his pistol. According to several eyewitnesses, the defendant then announced, pointing the gun at his victim, shut up or I'll blow your head off. Excuse me, I misquote. Shut up or I'll blow her head off. Apparently the crowd did not respond to Mays' directive quickly enough, and so the defendant did just as he said he would. Mr. Mays had a prior homicide conviction in North Carolina. The whole issue of capital punishment is obviously a serious one and an emotional one. Witness yesterday's article in the New York Times Magazine section. It is a subject concerning which people of goodwill and intelligence have honestly disagreed over the years. The abolitionists who seek, quote, life without the possibility of parole, close quote, have a strong audience. However, there always seems to be a possibility of parole as witness Messrs. Mackey and Victory the two police killers with serious prior convictions for violent crimes. Thank you. Well, I'm here to disavow any connection with the prosecution of people for uh, homicide. Speak up, please. You can't hear me? Well, can you hear me now? <clears throat> I was one of those unfortunate prosecutors who was never in the Homicide Bureau. So in 1959, after leaving a law firm, uh, I was asked by a judge to, uh, to uh, handle a death penalty case, the case of uh, Habib Riyad Hawa, he was called. Um, I was in my early 30s at the time, and the uh, senior counsel was a man twice my age who asked me, literally, listen kid, do you want to try this case on your own? I said, no, I'll try the case, but not on my own, because I didn't think it was seemly that um, that I should sum up in a death penalty case when I'd never tried a homicide case before that. Uh, what happened in the Hawa case was very simple. Hawa, who uh, was six foot two or three and blonde and blue eyed, who claimed he was Egyptian, spoke about seven or eight languages and had one of the highest IQs ever coming through the uh, Court of General Sessions. And Hawa went into a liquor store with a pistol and held up two employees and put them in the back. One of the employees, grabbed hold of a pistol on a shelf and came out shooting at Hawa, according to Hawa. Came out shooting, saying, this is it. And Hawa shot back, shot back and put five bullets into the victim. Hawa claimed to me that um, at the time that he went in to rob the liquor store, he was uh, liquored up, as he said. Uh, he had quite a few drinks. I said to him, it didn't seem to affect your aim any, but um, Five bullets with a pistol is something that, uh, having been in the army myself, I just didn't believe anybody could do, except in the movies. In any event, um, Hawa claimed, as I said, that the man came out shooting at him, saying this is it, and that he, Hawa, uh, thought he'd been shot because apparently a bottle of liqueur had been hit behind him and it splashed his back. Um, what I did is um, I went up to see the employee who was not brave enough to come out of the back room and was alive and asked him what happened. I told him I'd been assigned by the court to represent uh, the accused and he very candidly confirmed what Howard told me. He told me that the victim um, was a very strong, powerful person who claimed that nobody would ever hold up the liquor store and get away with it. And that in fact he did say after he came out with the pistol and Howard was emptying the cash register he did say, this is it, and started to shoot. Well, um, Howell was indicted for intentional murder and felony murder. And felony murder, as most of you know, doesn't require an intent to kill, just an intent to rob. Um, so what, what we did in the case, and, um, and um, it was what I did, actually, um, is uh, we uh, hired a psychiatrist who had been the chief psychiatrist of General Session, a man called Dr. Ornstein, who on the basis of a hypothetical that uh, I set up, uh, where I brought out that the man had uh, 
uh, the car on his back, which the police officer, into whose arms Hawa ran when he ran out of the store, um, testified that he had liquor on his back. And uh, we brought out that this is it because I cross-examined the employee who confirmed everything that Hawa said. Uh, the uh, psychiatrist uh, testified that Hawa shot reflexly. Those were his exact words. Remember? John and I were adversaries in that case. Um, shot reflexly. When I tried to introduce the evidence, I remember the judge, who didn't care for me all that much, and I had been a prosecutor, I didn't care for him all that much either. Uh, he was not a popular judge. You didn't care for him that much either. None of us really cared for him that much. <laughs> He had, I don't think, he uh, had some problems. We may name him. Yeah, I'm not going to mention him. He was a nice person off the bench. Um, but he had some problem with my introducing that kind of testimony from a psychiatrist that he shot me flexibly. It was not an insanity defense, which was difficult. So I remember, uh, and he said, you know, it's felony murder. And I reminded him that there was an intentional murder count. If the DA was willing to drop the intentional murder, I wouldn't put in the reflexly. Well, they wouldn't do that. And remember, Denza got called down, chief of the appeals bureau, and he said, I don't see any reason why it can't be introduced. It's another opinion on the question of intent. Now, obviously, the reason that I was putting it in was twofold. It was not just to counterpoint intentional murder, but it was also to put before the jury the subliminal theme that uh, the accused did not have a murderous intent. The victim did. And hopefully that was persuasive because the jury uh, acquitted uh, Hawa of uh, intentional murder and uh, recommended life in prison. Um, Hawa, who was a very fascinating person, told me he didn't want to spend his life in prison. That uh, life in prison with the kinds of people that he was in prison with at the time was not the kind of life he foresaw for himself. So he wanted the death penalty and he wanted to ask the judge to impose the death penalty, so I let him tell the judge that. And he got up and told the judge that, as far as he was concerned, the jury had recommended mercy, and mercy, in his view, was death, not life in prison. Uh, which, of course, is an interesting argument for the abolitionists. Right? In any event, um, uh, how, uh, when we went back to the cell, um, uh, he and I had a discussion, and Howard asked me if I would handle his appeal, and I told him that there was no purpose in handling it, uh, and that realistically, if he wanted to die in prison, uh, surely he was smart enough to find a way. I wasn't in the business of assisted suicide. I was in the business, I told him, of giving people options to live, and uh, hope we were lucky that we did. Now, just as an aside, and John asked me to mention this, I was living in Stuyvesant at the time, with my wife and at least one of our children, and um, uh, I bumped into one of the jurors who had recommended life, and he said to me, why didn't you put him on the stand? And in a moment of candor, and maybe I shouldn't have said this, I said, well, he had committed two or three robberies aside from this one. And the jury said, well, if we knew that, we would have given him the death penalty. And I said, that's what we assumed. Um, that was that case. The only other case that I'll mention, because I only had two other death penalty cases, but one of them, by the time I went to trial, also, John King and I were adversaries, the death penalty was eliminated. That was the Wiley Hoffman murder case many years ago. Um, but the second case that I was in was what's called the Dracula murder case. Perhaps you've heard of it, but the Cape Man. And I represented one of the seven uh, defendants in that case, uh, uh, a young kid called Rogelio Soto. Of course, Agron, the one who was the killer, uh, was about, what, 17 or 18 at the time he went to trial? Yeah, 16. Yeah. John doesn't remember that case. No, I just say I don't remember the age. Yeah, he was, he was, a, young, he was a young man. And what, he, it, what had happened is seven Puerto Rican kids went down to a playground, and I think it was on 48th Street on the west side, to avenge the eviction of some Puerto Rican kids by some non-Puerto Rican white kids in that playground. And it happened on a Saturday night. And according to the evidence, which was quite gruesome, Agron confessed to the police that when you ram the knife in quickly, pull it out quickly, you leave no blood on the knife. 
also one of the witnesses whom he had stabbed in the stomach, but who lived, identified Agron. So there was no question but that Agron was guilty of the killing. Uh, and there was a, an intentional murder case. Uh, as I say, there were seven kids in the case, seven defendants. Um, three of them pleaded out to manslaughter one and got seven and a half to 15 years. Uh, I refused, and my client didn't, didn't want to take it anyway, refused to take that plea. Um, the evidence against my client were, came uh, from two sources. One was the material witness, a fellow called Hector Belerse, who testified that when they went to the playground, my client entered the playground along with Agron, the knife wielder, who killed two kids with his knife, stabbed the third. And Hernandez, the umbrella man, as he was called, because he had an umbrella and was whacking people on the head and sort of stabbing or poking them, but didn't kill anybody, and some other kids, that my client threw the first punch that led to the ultimate slaughter in that playground. Uh, that was one. The other piece of evidence was that my client had blood on his pants when he left the playground. That piece of unfortunate evidence came in against my client when the lawyer for the umbrella man, Hernandez, made the unfortunate choice, and I'll say it now because I begged him not to do it, to put Hernandez on the stand. I told him that if he put him on the stand, arrogantly I told him, you convict a kid of murder, which is exactly what happened. Hernandez was convicted of murder, but anticipating that Hernandez would be asked by the prosecutor whether my client had blood on his pants when he and Hernandez were running out of the playground, I rested at the end of the people's case. The end of the case against the four defendants, I asked the judge for an instruction we were out of the case, because I realized that they were going to bring in the blood. I had a discussion with uh, Soto where he asked me whether he could take the stand. I told him, you shouldn't. And he said, why? And I said, because I think the prosecutor will ask you three questions, one of which will be, um, when you entered the playground, did you have any blood on your pants? The second of which will be, when you left, did you have any blood on, the, any blood on your pants? The answer will be yes. The first one would be no. And the third and damning question would be, whose blood? And I said, if you take the stand, you will be convicted, possibly of murder, which is what happened to Hernandez, because the Court of Appeals reversed Hernandez on the facts, said going to a murder doesn't make you a murderer. Uh, um, the, um, we got, luckily, um, the lowest verdict in the case. I like to tell this story because this is one of the good war stories that defense lawyers can tell. We got manslaughter too. In my case, this case of Soto. My wife and I and one or two of our children were walking in Central Park, and one of the jurors in the case came up to me and said, does your client realize what you did for him? And I said to him, what did I do for him? He got, uh, I think it was seven and a half to 15 years in prison. We reversed it on appeal, but I said, what did I do for him? But what's fascinating about the question is, that although the evidence from the material witness who conceded on, when I cross-examined them that my client was not there on the Thursday night before when they were planning revenge, the, these kids, he was not there on Friday night when they were planning revenge, and on Saturday night right before they went to the playground, when they were talking about going to the playground, my client was sitting six feet away from all the conversation talking to his girlfriend. That was the evidence. There was no evidence against my client that he knew that there was going to be anything like a killing. But the juror said to me, in code, he got a break. We should have sent him to the electric chair, which is what they did with Hernandez, because the evidence against Hernandez was he didn't stab anybody, he didn't kill anybody. Now, um, interestingly, on the way out of court, Agron said to me, who was convicted of murder and was facing the death penalty, said to me, I'll be seeing you, Mr. Hoffinger. And I said, I don't think so, Sal. Now, other than telling war stories, what am I here really to tell you? What, what can I tell you about death penalty in those days? I'm here to confess to you that at the time 
that I tried those two death penalty cases, and I was pretty young, and so were my, uh, well, in the first case, the, the man uh, who was lead counsel was twice the age. But there, in that time, aside from our rational antipathy to the death penalty, aside from the fact that we were intellectually opposed to the death penalty, I don't think we had any feeling of the horror and the cruelty of what the death penalty really means and what it really meant then. Perhaps if we did, we couldn't have tried the cases as calmly as we did. We didn't discuss the possibilities of these people, especially Soto, who was 17 years old, the possibility of his dying. You know, while I was on the case, a priest called me from the tombs and said, why is your client Soto indicted for murder? He didn't commit any murder. Understanding, as he did, the Soto did not commit murder. Understanding, as he did, that you can be indicted for a murder you, you didn't commit, and you can be convicted of a murder you didn't commit, and you can die for murder. But putting aside innocence, which to my mind complicates the question, the, the cold-blooded killing of these people, and you're confronted with it if you read through this book, Condemned, that cruelty, that horror, I don't believe we experienced. We didn't look into the heart of darkness when we were trying those cases. Um, we were, I believe, numb to the cruelty. Um, you know, the poet uh, Don, John Donne says, every man's death diminishes me, or everyone's death diminishes all of us. Um, reading this book, I confess that I felt diminished because I didn't ever confront the cruelty. I think that, um, that back in those days, and maybe to some extent today, a large segment of our society is, with respect to the death penalty, numbed down. And that's a phrase that Professor Robert J. Lifton has used in connection with the death penalty. We are numbed down. We were numbed down then. Well, all that I can say is this, in closing, if we are numbed down, then this book is a good antidote. Scott Christensen is really the person you ought to hear from tonight because as my friend and former we're one year apart of law school, so we've been friends for a long time. Uh, Jack Hoffinger said... Former student. <laughs> that what you can say? Former friend. We were... Uh, uh, Scott Christensen has indeed uh, taken the, the, the hood off capital punishment and made us all see the real faces, the names, the, the histories, what was left in the cell, people who were sentenced to death. I urge all of you to read that book. It's a, it's, it's a riveting book. Um, I first became, first let me say that all of us here uh, are going by memory. Uh, we will all state our impressions. Some of those impressions may not have been accurate, but they were impressions. And I think that uh, we all ought to be free to state them. And if people have different versions of what occurred, that is perfectly understandable because we're all giving our impressions of events that occurred uh, 40 years ago. Um, I first became involved in death penalty work in 1958 when um, a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine and colleague, the late Professor Edmund Kahn, asked me to become counsel to something called the New York Committee to Abolish Capital Punishment. And I said to him, Edmund, this is a waste of time. Why do you want me to do this? And uh, he pulled the book off the shelf with the Talmud and read to me the phrase that you've heard so often, the rescue of a single life is as if one has saved the world. Uh, and I took the job. Now in those days, uh, no one ever thought of litigation. The notion of litigating against the death penalty uh, simply was, was not something that people thought of doing. 
When I took this assignment, it was primarily to start a political process. We would uh, travel around the state organizing branches of the New York Committee to abolish capital punishment. Uh, we thought of legislation, how we would move the legislative process. But remember, 1958, the surviving was still the survivors of the Scottsboro Boys case, the Sacco and Vanzetti case, and so many of us had the, the thought that you know, this was common in death penalty cases, that there would be a lot of lawyers present representing people on the sentence of death. I quickly discovered that that was not the case. Shortly after the formation of this committee, um, I learned that Nelson, Governor Nelson Rockefeller, two of whose counsels are here tonight, uh, was going to be scheduling a clemency hearing involving Edward Eckworth. And everyone was curious to see how this local Republican governor was going to handle the first clemency hearing. And I called the lawyer for Edward Eckworth and asked if I could be of any help. And much to my surprise, he said to me, if you want to argue the clemency appeal, go right ahead. And I was rather stunned, but I, uh, on my typewriter, typed the clemency appeal. I went up to Albany. He was a wintry day in the sun in, in February of, uh, of 1959, and uh, was accompanied by a reporter for the New York Post, Ali Pilot. And I said, I needed a place to work, and he said, come on, use my office. And there I finished my work on the clemency appeal. A few minutes later, I was standing before Nelson Rockefeller in the Red Room, and uh, talking about Edward Eckworth's unfortunate family background. And uh, I don't recall whether any of his counsel were present, but I remember looking very carefully and intently at Governor Rockefeller, who kind of stared back at me. And uh, I had no idea what his reaction was, but as we left the Red Room, Ollie Pilot said to me, they don't call him Rocky for nothing. And uh, uh, Edworth's clemency appeal was denied, and he was, uh, was executed. Um, I quickly discovered, after becoming involved in a variety of other clemency cases, that uh, the, the process that I thought existed in New York, namely that lawyers would be assigned to represent, or hired to represent death penalty cases up to the time of death, was simply not the case. In those days, lawyers were paid for the trial. As I remember, it was something like uh, four or five lawyers could be assigned. The total amount of money that was assigned was four or five hundred dollars. Uh, the general practice was that one lawyer would try the case, they, they would split the money, and uh, no money was available on appeal, although probably most lawyers took the appeals. And after the appeal, uh, it was per chance, and that's why uh, what you now have when death penalty, uh, death uh, house inmates remained struggling for a long time with their cases, didn't really exist then. It was only those who could afford lawyers. But the others, the, uh, there was a very short time interval. Uh, now, there was another development at the time, and that was the Warren Court was starting its, its road toward uh, constitutionalizing certain aspects of state criminal procedure and like coerced confessions, searches and seizures, and those, the cases that came, that were coming through the courts were often death penalty cases. So the, we got into litigating these cases in habeas corpus uh, and, you know, as, a, as a process where we were kind of piggybacking on the, the opinions that were coming down uh, from the Warren Court. Uh, and I remember uh, taking my first rid of habeas corpus down to federal district court in the southern district and the clerk looked at it and said do I file this on the civil or criminal and uh, I didn't quite know how to answer but I looked at the papers and the papers showed the prisoner's name which was a, a individual and, and the defendant was Warden Denno and so I saw two names and I learning from what I did at law school said this must be civil and so they got filed on the civil, and that may be how 
cases, maybe pure accident, but that's how cases were filed as civil cases that involved habeas corpus. Um, but most of our time was spent not so much litigating, but we were very much involved in the, um, in the legislative process. And one very important difference I must emphasize to all of you is that in those days we really did debate issues that no one debates today. We debated issues such as deterrence, such as the cost of execution versus the cost of a life sentence. We discussed the question of whether recidivists were more likely to commit felonies and or murders than anyone else. Uh, we discussed, we started to discuss, but really people were afraid to discuss, the issue of racial bias in the criminal justice system. Uh, when I first raised this issue, uh, Sarah Ehrman, who the elder people in this audience will remember that name, she was the patron saint of the abolition movement. She formed the, uh, the American League to Abolish Capital Punishment in the Sacco and Benzetti case. And she was sitting next to me in a, in a public gathering when I expressed the view that the death penalty was being operated in a discriminatory manner. And she said to me, young man, that's an argument you should never make because it is not true. Now, one has only to look at the statistics uh, to see the appalling uh, misbounds. I think of the last 14 people to be executed in New York State, one was white, uh, one was Puerto Rican, and the other was, well, the other 12 were, were black. I think those are the numbers. Now, uh, I am not stating at all that uh, that Governor Rockefeller or anyone else in the process uh, was personally biased. But the system was operated in a way that produced a biased result. The one issue, the one issue that was never put forward by the proponents of the death penalty, except in one case that I saw it done, was the issue of revenge. People, oddly enough, were ashamed to say that revenge was a valid reason for killing people. And if you compare that today, that's the only issue that's left. <laughs> uh, when people talk about the need for executions, what they refer to is, um, is the need to put these people away, to, to get revenge for a horrible thing that was done. And that was precisely the issue that, uh, that no one raised at the time. Uh, my impression of the governor's office was that uh, council were very good people to deal with. Uh, the governor himself was someone that we really did not have contact with. I thought that uh, the few times that I appeared before Nelson Rockefeller, he took uh, the issue of uh, clemency very seriously. Uh, he had a, I must say, a, a very stern demeanor which conveyed the impression that he was a difficult man to persuade, but I'm sure that uh, Saul Corbin and uh, Bob McCrate may have a different view. Finally, in, uh, a commission was appointed, appointed uh, by, uh, uh, in, in, uh, by the governor in, uh, it was in the 1960s, the 19, uh, the 1950s, uh, a commission was appointed to study the revision of the penal code. The chair of that commission was a good friend who couldn't be here tonight for personal reasons, Dick Bartlett, who was a well-known uh, assembly person from upstate New York from Glens Falls. Dick Bartlett started out as not being an opponent of the penalty. In fact, uh, if he had any views on it, it was in favor of the penalty. And uh, this commission, studied long and hard, and finally came forward in, uh, in a report dated March 19th, 1965. There was a report of a majority of members of the commission recommending the abolition of the death penalty. Uh, and there was a dissent, uh, but the, uh, this was a remarkable document, and it came forward in March of 1965 at a time when the Democrats control both houses of the state legislature. Some of you may remember that in the fall of 1964, Barry Goldwater uh, was running for president of the United States, 
against Nelson Rockefeller. And uh, there was an overwhelming democratic landslide. Uh, I have said that uh, the abolition movement uh, owed a lot to Barry Goldwater because uh, the, the democratic legislature passed what was then regarded as an abolition bill. It's true, there were some exceptions, but those who were fighting for the abolition of death penalty, the death penalty regarded it as an abolition bill. And my impression, and I know Saul Corbin will disagree with this, my impression was, and again, this was only an impression, was that Governor Rockefeller uh, had difficulty with whether to sign that bill or not. Uh, and there was a period of time when the bill was, was sitting on the governor's desk, and many of us in the abolition movement were very worried as to whether the governor would sign the bill. There was a lot of lobbying that went on. Uh, I contacted a lot of civil, civil rights groups. It's interesting that uh, today, while African-American groups are very much opposed to the death penalty, they were very divided at the time. Uh, many African-American groups did not wish to be identified with killers. But as a result of a, a lot of arm twisting and phone calls and letter writing, uh, Governor Rockefeller signed this bill. Again, I'm saying it was the result of that. The governor may have always wanted to sign this bill. You'll be hearing from Saul Corbin, who had much closer identification uh, with it than I did. Uh, the, we regarded it as a uh, monumental victory, uh, the virtual abolition of that penalty. When the Supreme Court acted in 1972, uh, and then it basically reinstated the death penalty two years later, uh, it was a long time before executions uh, took place in the United States. But that victory in New York in uh, the early 1960s was a tremendous one. And uh, was the result of what may have been the last time people were looking at the death penalty in a rational way. Uh, my own prediction parallels uh, the reaction of, uh, of Justice Blackman. When Justice Blackman said he could no longer tinker with the machinery of death. It seems to me that uh, ever since the Furman case, this, the country has been trying to find out if there is a rational way to execute people. There is no rational way to execute people. And I believe that uh, sooner or later, this country will face a choice. They must either treat the death penalty like any other penalty and stop trying to tinker with the machinery of death, or uh, they will abolish it. And if they start treating the death penalty like any other penalty, Instead of 3,000 people on death row, there will be 4,000, maybe 5,000, maybe 6,000 people on death row as people continue to tinker with the machinery of death. Faced with that choice, I believe that ultimately this country, starting with the moratorium that has already been imposed in some states and by Governor Ryan, whom we heard last week, this country will ultimately abolish capital punishment. I would like to close by reading a statement from an author that uh, I'm close to, namely myself. The, uh, the statement reads as follows. The administration of criminal justice is designed to establish proof of criminal guilt beyond a reasonable doubt because of a recognition that our system contains too many uncertainties to permit a standard of no doubt. Yet the death penalty assumes a standard of guilt beyond any doubt and is applied in those cases where the doubts are the greatest. The death penalty assumes that we all, that we know all the answers about criminal responsibility, criminal intent, the finding of fact, the choosing of juries. The death penalty assumes a perfect system, although the system itself recognized long ago that it could never meet a standard of perfection, and that therefore created the standard of reasonable doubt. Similarly, the death penalty is irreconcilable with a system of penal administration which speaks in terms of rehabilitation, deterrence, and public security. The dead cannot be rehabilitated. All the evidence demonstrates that capital punishment is not a unique deterrent to murder, and public security is actually endangered 
by the retention of a penalty, which creates a false sense of protection, thereby distracting the public from coming to grips with the realities of crime prevention and prisoner rehabilitation. The electric chair is the ultimate symbol of irrationality, brutal vengeance, senseless discrimination, the embodiment of all that we have tried to overcome in the march toward a humane and rational system of criminal justice. It is like a cancerous growth which infects the entire body of our penal system from the moment a crime is committed to the time a prisoner has his last contact with the state. It infects the behavior of the police, the press, prosecutors, juries, lawyers, judges, everyone who has any contact with the administration of justice. It makes a humane system of punishment impossible because it sets a benchmark of irrational vengeance from which all other punishments are measured. Now this comes from a statement that I submitted to the commission that was studying the criminal justice system. I delivered this statement on December 7th, 1962. It sounded good then, 38 years later. It seems even better. Thank you. 42 years ago, that's a long time. This month, Roswell Perkins, who is guiding the transition, the recently elected governor, recruited this sometime Wall Street lawyer, joined the new administration in Auburn, and to become counsel to the governor following the 1959 legislative session. During the immediately preceding three years, I had chaired the Committee on State Legislation of this association and had worked with the Office of Counsel to the Governor in its review of legislation. This had provided me with substantial knowledge of the processing of legislation by a governor's staff. On the other hand, the process by which a governor exercises the broad powers to grant reprieves and commute sentences granted by Article 4, Section 4 of the state constitution was one with which I had had no acquaintance. By 1959, a well-established procedure for processing applications for reprieves and for commutation of death sentences had been developed by successive administrations. The exercise of the gubernatorial power of clemency was necessarily dependent upon an application having been made to the governor by or on behalf of a prisoner. But there was no formal requirement for such applications. In death cases, right up to the night of execution, applications could be made and telephone lines were kept open by the executive chamber's operator during that evening between the warden at Sing Sing and the governor's council and the governor to deal with any last minute developments. Applications for clemency that were received in advance of the day scheduled for an execution were thoroughly examined by the governor's council. The entire case file was examined, the prior proceedings, any parole or probation sociological reports, psychiatric testing, done while the prisoner was at Sing Sing, and views of the prosecuting attorney and of the sentencing judge were solicited. During the Rockefeller years, if the review of the case warranted, a hearing would be scheduled before the governor in the ceremonial red room in the executive chamber. Counsel's office had been staffed and organized by Roswell Perkins during the transition period, so that when I joined the office in Albany uh, on February the 23rd, 1959, in the midst of the legislative session, personnel and procedures for all areas of council's responsibilities were in place. In organizing <coughs> council's office, Rod Perkins began the practice, later followed 
of recruiting one assistant counsel from the New York County District Attorney's Office. The highly regarded Frank Hogan was the DA. William Rand, Howard Jones, and Archibald Murray all followed this path into the counsel's office. During the period 1959 to 1965, counsel's office followed the practice of having the assistant counsel who had had criminal justice experience conduct the review of each case and prepare a written memorandum which was circulated among all lawyers in counsel's office and then was discussed at a meeting around the large table in the counsel's personal office. The counsel would then present the matter to the governor before any clemency hearing. At the hearing, the counsel would enter with the governor and sit at the side of the governor's desk. Among the materials assembled for tonight's program, you'll find a chronology of capital punishment and executive clemency during the years 1959 to 65 that I have recently compiled out of old records, including my personal diary. In it, I have attempted to list each of the cases in which a defendant sought to have the governor exercise his clemency powers, each reprieve or commutation of the death penalty, and the death penalties that were carried out during this period. Among the cases reviewed, two remain vividly etched in my mind. The first was the case of Peter Pollock, for whom two reprieves were granted in 1959 following an initial, an initial clemency hearing that permitted an appeal to the United States Supreme Court. When that appeal failed, a second clemency hearing was held in April 1960. Extensive tests conducted at Sing Sing by the Governor's uh, Sanity Commission had disclosed that the defendant functioned at a low moron level. Yet the multiple court-appointed defense counsel had offered at the trial no evidence of his defective mentality. Our investigation in the counsel's office prior to the second clemency hearing confirmed that the appointment of multiple defense counsel had been the product of a political patronage system run wild. Governor Rockefeller's sense of justice was offended. Not only was the defendant granted clemency, but the experience raised serious concerns for the governor regarding the entire machinery of capital punishment. The second case etched in my mind was the case of Salvador Agron, the youth known as the Cape Man. After I had briefed the governor in his private office, I followed him into the Red Room for the hearing. The large chamber was exceptionally crowded with a substantial delegation from the Puerto Rican community in New York City, led by the Maris of San Juan, who had journeyed to Albany to attend the clemency hearings. At the conclusion of the lawyer's presentations, to my surprise, the governor rose at his desk and began to address the audience in English and in Spanish. Step by step, he traced the life of Salvador Agron from poverty in San Juan to Hell's Kitchen on Manhattan's west side, pausing periodically each time to inquire rhetorically of the tense assembly, where were you then? Having completed his account of this tragic long, young life, the governor turned to me and said quietly, Bob, let's go. And I followed him back into his private office. One week later, the governor on February 7th 
commuted Salvador Agron's sentence of death to life in prison. The chronology compiled for this program discloses that the Pollock and Agron cases were just two of more than 20 cases in which the sentence of death had been imposed, which were brought to the governor's office by request for a reprieve or for a commutation of sentence during the period that I served as governor, from June, as counsel, forgive me, from June 1, uh, 1959 to June 30, 1962. Within the first month that I served as counsel, the governor had two clemency hearings and granted several reprieves to prisoners. For me, such direct participation in the process was a compelling experience, as were the night watches in the council's office on each night in which there was an execution. The chronology which I assembled also discloses that the direct involvement of the executive chamber in the process of executive clemency soon led to an exploration within the administration of the entire subject of capital punishment. The agenda for a staff meeting with the governor on January 25, 1960, exp expressly refers to consideration of a proposed commission to study capital punishment in New York. My diary indicates that on March 15, 1960, a little over a month later, I met with Norman Redwood and representatives of the Committee to Abolish Capital Punishment in the Executive Chamber. Neither Norman nor I uh, have any recollection of that meeting today, but I believe my diary, and I think I could get it in evidence in any court. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Norman and I were talking about this, and he was, indeed making a presentation, I'm certain, at that time. Now, by the time of the governor's annual message to the legislature in January 1961, the next year, the concept of a study commission had matured into a proposed commission to revise both the penal law and the code of criminal procedure. In early April 1961, the governor signed into, the, into law the bill that created a temporary commission on revision of the penal law and criminal code with stated, stated objectives that included reviewing sentencing practices and the theory of punishment in criminal cases. Shortly thereafter, the governor designated then Assemblyman Richard Bartlett, a classmate of mine in law school, to chair the commission. A year later, a further, further bill was enacted that broadened the powers of the Bartlett Commission and made clear its responsibilities with respect to the law governing sentencing and extended the commission's life. Saul Corbin, who followed me then, follows me this evening, will pick up the story of the Bartlett Commission in July of 1962. Thank you. Uh, recollection of those events. In addition, I would like to preface my remarks to say that I spent a fair amount of my time researching the record. Can you hear me okay? Okay. I succeeded Bob McCrae, as he said, as counsel of the governor, uh, serving from July 1962 to September uh, 1965. Uh, during that period, there were five death sentence cases that came before the governor, all in 1963. In, in my talk this evening, I plan to discuss three areas. First, 
the governor's role in death sentence cases. Second, the general penal law revisions in 1963 and 1965. And last but not least, the purpose of the review the abolition of capital punishment in 1965. I'd like to start first with the governor's role in death sentence cases. Uh, during 1962 to 1965, the governor continued his practice, as Bob narrated, of holding hearings when requested in all death sentence cases. In three of those cases, the governor granted clemency commuting the sentences from death to life in prison. In each of those cases, the governor cited the fact that the district attorney and the trial judge had each recommended clemency following a standard inquiry of them by counsel's office. In the other two cases, the governor, in 1963, declined to grant clemency, and the two men were executed. Neither of the men had received recommendations of clemency from the district attorney or the trial judge, and to add on Bob's point, there was no evidence that any of them were low-grade morons. On nights when executions were scheduled by the warden of Sing Sing Prison, the practice was the same. By prearrangement with the governor, we had phone numbers where he could be reached the entire evening. The telephone operator and we were on duty in the executive chamber in the camper. We were available in case a court had granted a stay of execution. We were also there to be able to communicate with the governor and the warden. By prearrangement, the warden had a direct line open to receive calls from the executive chamber. Also, by prearrangement, the governor was able to call us in case he had decided to commute the death sentence of a man scheduled to be executed that night. Finally, also by prearrangement, the warden, about 10 minutes before the scheduled time for execution, would call to inquire of us whether there had been a last minute court stay or a reprieve from the governor. We were then in a position to respond to the warden's call. To this very day, those two executions evoke a deep emotional response in me. Those were the last two executions during the governor's term because, as was reported, in 1965 he approved a bill that effectively abolished capital punishment. Before turning to that bill, I'd like to spend a few minutes to pick up on Bob's points about the Bartlett Commission. Bartlett was always a good friend of mine as well. In 1963 and 1965, there were general penal law revisions signed by the governor. Uh, as Bob McCrae has described, the governor supported the creation of the commission as well as the work product of the commission during Bob Sturman's council. And during my time, he did the same. <laughs> During my term, the governor supported the following legislation recommended by the commission. In 1963, legislation eliminating the mandatory death penalty in premeditated murder cases and kidnapping cases were appro was approved by the governor. The mandatory penalty was replaced by the two-stage jury procedure, which was patterned on the American Law Institute's model penal code. The court also by that bill, approved by the governor, was empowered to accept a guilty plea with a sentence of life in prison. In 1965, 
the governor also approved legislation enacting the first comprehensive revision of the penal law and criminal code since 1881. Let me now turn to the most pertinent discussion of this evening, which is the abolition. In 1965, the governor approved legislation abolishing capital punishment in all cases of murder in the first degree, with two limited exceptions. The exceptions covered, one, the killing of a peace officer in the course of performing his official duties. Second exception was for cases where the defendant, at the time he committed the crime, was serving actual life imprisonment sentence, or was sentenced to life imprisonment. The legislation was based on an 85-page typewritten special report on capital punishment by the Bartlett Commission. That report, I believe, is in the materials you have before you. It was the same report in that same form that was submitted to the legislature, I believe. In any event, the commission's bill was supported by an eight to four vote in favor of abolition by the members of the commission. The bill the commission recommended was approved in the Senate by a 47 to nine vote. It received final passage on May 19 in the assembly by a 76 to 67 vote, barely two votes more than a constitutional majority. The bill was engrossed by the legislature and sent to the governor on May 23 as a 10-day bill. Normally, the governor has more bills submitted as 30-day bills at the end of the session. But while the legislature remains in session, it comes to a 10-day bill meaning that the governor had 10 days within which to act. Upon its passage by the assembly, I met with the governor. I said, I know that by this time, many people have given you their various views on capital punishment, but I would appreciate your reserving extra time for discussion when I bring the bill to you for action. He readily agreed. Now, in presenting major bills to the governor for his attention and action, it was my practice to set forth the arguments in favor of the bill, the arguments against the bill, in each case as fairly as possible, and after discussion, my recommendation. This was the procedure used when in late May, and discuss the Commission's bill with the Governor. First, we discuss the principal arguments supporting the bill. One, the immorality of societies taking the life of one person in retribution for his taking the life of another. Two, the risk of executing a person who may have been erroneously convicted of a crime. Three, the difficulty in administering a death penalty system and making rational distinctions between those cases where it is imposed and those cases where it is not imposed. And last but not least, the lack of clarity as to whether the penalty is a true deterrent to murder. We then turn to the principal arguments supporting disapproval of the bill. I stated the governor the view that the perpetrator's fear of the death penalty does act as a deterrent to murder. I also repeated the belief that it is not more morally wrong to take a murderer's life than it is to imprison him for life. And three, that the two-stage procedure that I described earlier and was described in great detail by judge, our federal judge, 
at that time, assistant district attorney. The two-stage procedure had not been given a fair trial in separating out murder cases where the death penalty should not be imposed. We also discussed, the governor and I, the two exceptions to the bill. Specifically, in response to a reporter's inquiry at an earlier news conference, the governor had asked, rhetorically, perhaps, I later found not rhetorically, whether it was moral to execute a person who murdered a police officer or a prison guard, but not one who murdered anyone else. He also questioned whether these exceptions, the two exceptions, were appropriate if, in fact, the death penalty had no deterrent effect. After full discussion, I stated that it was my recommendation that the governor should approve the bill. I noted that the two exceptions on balance, which he had been concerned about, dealt with the commission's efforts to give some recognition to deterrence. Incidentally, that was confirmed to me by none other than Judge Whitman Knapp, who was a member of the commission only about a month ago. In my view, the exceptions at the time did not warrant veto of the bill, and I so told the governor, and he agreed. He then went a step further. In approving the abolition bill, Governor Rockefeller publicly announced that he would commute the sentences of all convicted persons, then under sentence to capital punishment, if they would not have been subject to capital punishment under the new statute. At the time, it was reported that of the 20 persons then subject to the death penalty, 17 would receive commutations to life sentences. I would like to turn a little bit to the suggestion by Norman Redler, whom I admire, uh, that the Democrats produced this legislation and the governor reluctantly perhaps signed it. I'd like to recount the facts, if you would, apart from my own discussions with the governor as I just narrated them. The Penal Law Commission, the Bartlett Commission, is noted was created in 1961, not only on recommendation of the governor, but when it was created, the nine original appointees were all selected on their merits by the governor and the two legislative leaders. At that time, the governor and the two legislative leaders were all Republicans and their appointees included both Republicans and Democrats. I also would note that the commission chairman, Dick Bartlett, was a Republican. As a result of the Lyndon Johnson landslide victory over Barry Goldwater in 1964, the presidential election, the Democrats took control, as was narrated by Norman Reagan, of both the State Senate and the Assembly in 1965. There was no change in the Commission membership in 1965. The abolition bill, as noted, passed the Senate by 47 to 9. 18 Republican Senators out of 24 voted in favor of abolition. Also as noted, the Assembly voted in favor of abolition by a bare majority of two votes necessary for passage. By my count, 19 Republicans in the Assembly voted in favor and provided the necessary votes for passage. I would also note that among those who voted no, there were six Republicans and three Democrats. I add one further point that the Democrats, when they took control of the both houses in 65, could not agree on who their, who their leaders in the legislature would be. And it resulted in a debacle 
because April 1st came and went, and the state employees had no money to receive their compensation because the legislatures, the majorities in the legislature could not organize the legislature simply to select their leaders. And the only way that happened was when Mayor Wagner called Governor Rockefeller and said, I need your help. And he said, what, what do you want? He said, well, I need some votes. So the governor banged heads and got a, a number of Republicans to vote for the two leaders that did take over, Tony Trabia and Joe Zaretsky. I tell you all of this because it wasn't until well after April that the legislature finally got itself organized. And as I mentioned, they passed this bill on abolition on May 19. It was nowhere near uh, the end of the session because the bills after that uh, ran into the hundred, uh, into the uh, 1,020 or thereabouts. So uh, this was happened to be, I think, uh, chapter 323 or something like that of 1965. So I would hate to differ with Norman, but I think perhaps uh, he was not aware of all these facts. But maybe with the awareness of it, I think we realized that there was no partisanship, in my view, involved in the abolition of capital punishment in New York. Thank you.